And we are live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Eczema Podcast. Today, we are going to talk all about Staph aureus, how that contributes to your flares, to your skin, and to infections as well. I have my guest, Dr. Julie, here again, who I had last week. And a lot of you guys loved what she shared and you guys asked so many questions. So feel free to leave questions as we do this live interview. And I know that, um, oh, you guys are starting to leave questions already. We have someone who says, yay. <laughs> so let's talk about Staph aureus, Dr. Julie. And by the way, welcome back to the show. Um, I know that Staph aureus is a big part of our flares. I'll let you share and give a rundown of what it is and how it affects our skin. Yeah, thanks, Abby. It's staph, staph aureus is a really important organism, particularly for those who um, have eczema. And um, just a little background. So uh, staph aureus is short for staphylococcus aureus. Um, so sometimes as doctors, we get lazy and we say staph. We're usually referring to staphylococcus aureus or staph aureus. But just to be clear, staphylococcus is like a bigger group of lots of bacteria, and not all of them are staph aureus or pathogenic. So for example, there's staph, um, staphylococcus epidermidis, which is a normal, what we call commensal on the skin that actually can control staph aureus. So we should, we should not be lazy and we should always say staph aureus. But for the purpose of this podcast, if I'm saying staph, know that I'm specifically referring to staph aureus. Um, yeah, so Staph aureus is, is a, another bacteria that is present on the skin. Um, we have studies that map like the skin microbiome, and we find that Staph aureus is, is present just because it's there. It's not necessarily causing a problem. But there's some very, very interesting studies with eczema, and it's not just one. I mean, there's multiple at this point that show that prior to a flare of eczema, the staph aureus on the skin will start to rise before the flare. Then, so it rises, then the skin will start to flare. And we also see that the other kind of more commensal or good natural um, microbes that belong on the skin, they will start to plummet. So staph takes over, the good guys kind of disappear. Then you get your flare. And it's again, the opposite, not until staph aureus starts to go down, and the good guys start to take over, that happens before we start to see the skin flare. So Staph aureus is, is active before we get the eczema flare. And I think there's some confusion for people why well, don't have a staph infection. And it's true, you don't have a staph infection. We'll we'll get into what, you know, what kind of diseases um, of the skin staph aureus cause in, in its true infection phase. Uh, but if you have eczema and you're having a flare, you do have an overabundance of staph aureus. It, it pretty much goes hand in hand. And so I'm always in my mind treating my patients for staph aureus when their eczema is active. Thanks so much for sharing. I really appreciate it. Is there a test that can be done to see if there's staph aureus or we usually just know that there's staph during a, a flare? Yeah, I mean, so technically you can culture the skin and wait and grow out staff um, or whatever's on the skin. It can it can take seven plus days. Um, there's a couple problems though, that uh, mostly in order to culture things, we need a wet sample. So if you have a, an actual like infection and it's oozing and stuff, then your doctor is going to be able to swab something wet and culture it out. But we can't culture a dry skin. I never, I mean, I rarely would order the skin to be cultured because um, I think we can just, I can presumptively assume that there is an overabundance of staph on the skin and treat it. Now, if um, let's say somebody actually has a skin infection and we make an assumption that it's staph aureus and we treat with a certain antibiotic and the person is not responding, that would be a really good time then to culture the lesion and find out what the organism is that's causing this full-blown infection so that you can get the right antibiotic to it. But normal, for my eczema patients, we don't really uh, tend to do much culturing. I once heard uh, Dr. Aaron share that nine out of 10 people who suffer from eczema have an overgrowth of staph aureus. Would that be correct? I would agree with that, yes. And it's just, uh, it's crazy how so many of us do have an overgrowth of staff, but it's not often talked about or shared about. 
Yeah. And we, we actually have some understanding now as to like why that happens. So, um, again, Staph aureus is present on, on a lot of people. If you just go swab people out there, I mean, most people are going to have some level of Staph aureus on the skin. And it's interesting because when, um, they, they map the microbiome on the skin, there's two places where we find that Staphylococci in general, that those, all of the staph organisms like to hang out. This is gonna sound pretty familiar to people with eczema. It's here, what we call the antecubital fossa in the crook of the elbow and behind the knees, where we call the popliteal fossa. I don't think it's an accident that those are two very popular areas where people tend to have persistent eczema. Um, I think the, thin, the skin is thin and staph aureus kind of naturally hangs out there. And so they're the first places that may tend to overgrow. And um, we, we've done a whole episode on pH, but we, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention pH with Staph aureus because it's, it's intimately tied to basically what's happening. Because then the obvious question is, why? Where is all this Staph aureus coming from, right? Why, why do people with eczema have Staph and why is it growing out of control and what kind of is kicking off this process? And we have to talk about pH, so... We can do that now or later. <laughs> sure. We can briefly dive into it. And if anyone wants to look into it further, just do a search on my podcast archives for skin pH levels, how that affects the skin. That interview was with Dr. Julie as well. But yeah, Dr. Julie, I'll let you get into skin pH levels. Yeah. So just really briefly, uh, pH is a scale from acids to bases. Uh, in the States, we we study that in around junior high school and you get these little litmus uh strips of paper and, and you do experiments where you test them and you're looking, are they acids or bases and you're matching up the colors. Um, and the scale ranges from like zero to 14. So low pH, zero, one, two, really below seven are um, acids, acidic substances. So anything with the word acid in it, battery acid, stomach acid, but lemon juice, vinegar, those are all acidic substances. Um, then the middle of the scale is seven, that's neutral. Things like water and blood are neutral. And then at the high end of the scale is 14. So things that are kind of above seven, maybe eight to, to 14 are called basic or alkaline substances. And there's a lot of those things like drain cleaner, um, lye, baking soda. Uh, those are all examples of um, alkaline or basic substances. So with skin, it's a little bit surprising. Uh, most people guess, well, I'm going to just say, and I, when I ask patients, what, what do you think the skin pH should be to be healthy? People kind of go for a safety. They're like, how about seven? How about neutral? Because um, it feels like, oh, blood and water, maybe that's right. But it's surprisingly acidic. So it's more like four to five, five and a half. Um, the skin is absolutely acidic. And um, I tell patients when they're guessing, like, I'll give you a clue if you want. And when they ask for the clue, the clue is there's a fatty acid mantle on the skin. Now we hear the word acid, anything with the word acid in it, it's an acid. That's why it was named that way. So skin is surprisingly acidic because we create this protective acid mantle. Um, and some of that is um, if your viewers are well-versed in eczema, they may have heard of filagrin, which is a protein in skin. And filagrin creates something called natural moisturizing factor. A natural moisturizing factor really sets the tone for creating an acidic pH on the skin. Um, well, people with eczema, some of them have a genetic uh, mutation where they don't produce as much filagrin. It's an FLG uh, mutation. But even if you don't have a, a gene mutation, anyone who's having a flare of eczema is having decreased levels of filagrin and natural moisturizing production. And it, it changes the pH even more. So the pH of eczematous skin shifts up. It's no longer acidic. It's now neutral or alkaline. And that creates two problems. The first problem is Staph aureus loves a high pH. Its jam is 7.5. So it's trying to get the skin to 7.5 and keep it there. Because Staph aureus is, it's like when you have a fight over the temperature at home. You know, somebody wants it really cold and somebody wants it really hot. Staph aureus wants 7.5, and it keeps turning up the dial on your skin, your pH there. But the natural pH, we're trying to turn it down. We're like, no, we want to get down to like four, four and a half, five. And the reason is that we have things on our skin called antimicrobial peptides, like germcidin and defensin. I think they have fantastic names. They sound like superheroes of the skin. And um, it's their job to go around and fight things. They, they'll fight Staph aureus and say, nope, you're, you know what? You're getting out of control. 
we're going to beat you back down and put you in your place. But they're only really active at that healthy acidic skin pH. Once the skin pH shifts up to more like neutral, like that 7.5 or alkaline, dermcidin and defensin, instead of getting in there and like, yeah, yeah, we're going to get the staph aureus, they're frozen. And so it's like, oh boy, well, we see the staph aureus, but we can't, we can't get it. And now the staph aureus just grows out of control and you, you end up in a flare that, you know, some people can't get out of the flare, uh, or sometimes it's just this recurring kind of mess that it comes and it goes and it comes and it goes. And, um, it's, it's this whole balance. You got to get the pH back down to an acidic, acidic place so that dermcidin and defensin can do their natural job. Because somebody with eczema, you know, they've got, so they've got an overgrowth of staph aureus on their skin. It's not contagious. If they rub somebody with healthy skin, like if, if I touch somebody with eczema, I'm not going to get eczema. I'm not going to get a staph overgrowth because my skin is acidic and my dermcidin and defensin are going to be like, no, you're out of here. Not a chance. So that's why they're not like technically contagious when you don't have a full blown infection. Uh, but their skin pH, it's, Study after study shows the skin pH of people with eczema is high. It's neutral or alkaline. And, and now you're in a bad place where you can't get out of it. Thanks for sharing. I think that was a really great rundown and a breakdown of how our skin pH really influences the flares and the skin condition that we have. So I had a few questions from the community. Some of them asked, is this what causes their cellulitis or impetigo and infections as well? And does something change with staph aureus before an infection too? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of skin diseases that can involve uh, staph aureus um, and you named them uh, cellulitis and petigo and there's another one erysipelas. Um, but those three, and I'll, I'll, tell, I'll talk about what those three skin, skin conditions are. Um, they can either be staph aureus, but there's another um, organism um, group, uh, B-strep, um, so like strep pyogenes. Those are the two most likely organisms to, call, to cause all three of those conditions. So we don't necessarily know if somebody has impetigo, cellulitis, or erysipelas. Is it staph aureus induced or is it um, a strep uh, problem? Uh, there's antibiotics that we can give that are going to cover both organisms. Um, again, if you really needed to, you could try to culture and test. So impetigo is um, where it usually kind of happens around the mouth a lot, and it happens a lot more to kids, although I, I have had adult patients who it's happened to. Um, what we look for is these kind of honey, golden crusting lesions. Um, and that's a sure sign when you see that honey golden crusting color oozing lesions that it's in petigo. And yeah, it could be staph aureus or it could be strep. Um, we don't know. Cellulitis is a deep infection in the skin. So it's not a surface one. Impetigo is on the surface. Well, actually, let's go in order. So impetigo, we can see. Impetigo is very, very contagious. You don't want to be touching that or having kids with it touch other kids because it, it is transmissible. Um, erysipelas is another skin infection. It's it's not like on the skin in, in terms of like impetigo where it's like crusting. It's in that top layer of the skin, but it's in it. It's also either staph aureus or um, like a strep pyogenes, a, a group, um, sorry, I said group B, the group A strep. It's a group A streps are the respiratory and the skin. Group B is like the vaginal stuff when you give birth. So group A strep. Um, and it gets into the top layers of the skin and it causes like a very, very bright red, very angry looking um, skin infection. And there's very distinct borders. So it's like a very clear demarcation, like this skin is infected, the skin is not. Cellulitis is just a deeper layer infection of the skin. And so sometimes people get confused between erysipelas and cellulitis. So cellulitis is, is that those deeper layers of the dermis and, um, it's also red, but it's not quite usually as bright red. And the lines aren't like sharply demarcated like they are in erysipelas. As some people get confused. Usually cellulitis can affect like the lower legs a lot. Um, usually it's, it's just one, it's not both. If, if people have what looks like they, they, a lot of times they'll refer to the ER or call in dermatology thinking it's cellulitis and it's um, something called venous stasis where it's actually that the blood flow is backing up and you get this kind of dusky thing. And that happens on both legs. But cellulitis is usually 
uh, unilateral. It's only going to happen on one. But yeah, all three of those conditions, it can be staph aureus. It can be a group A strep like strep pyogenes. We don't really know. They're treated with antibiotics. Um, and the impetigo is, is very, very contagious. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate it. I, I had one person who also asked, can you tell if it's an infection or if it's TSW? That is a very good question and it's very difficult. So uh, folks in TSW, you know, the problem is they've had this vasoconstriction from years or however long of, of steroid use. And so their blood vessels were artificially constricted. Once we stop the steroids, the vessels are like, yeah, and they kind of over, uh, they become, it's called vasodilating, right? They overexpand. We get a lot of blood flow to the area and that can cause that red skin right? There's just so much blood flow happening, but it also causes that leaking where the fluid's actually leaking out of the vessels into the skin. So a lot of people with um, TSW, it does look like maybe a staph infection because there's oozing. And that might actually be a case where you'd want to um, do a culture of the fluid and see, is it just fluid or is there an actual staph aureus infection? I'll usually try like botanical topicals if they can stand it. Cause you know, another problem with TSW is it's just hard to get anything on the skin. Um, but we can do some trials with some like herbal antimicrobials that I, I can use on staff that usually work pretty well. And if nothing's happening, then I, I just more likely assume that it's just the TSW oozing, but not an actual infection. And a, a lot of infection is itches a lot. TSW burns a lot. Um, but the itching can be more of a put me in the direction that it's a staph aureus problem. Got it. Thanks, Dr. Julie. I know that everyone's eager to get into treatment, so we'll definitely talk about that soon. I also had other people who ha who asked what the oozing is that comes out during the flare. Is that part of the staph aureus? Um, and also what the colors mean as well. So if you have a staph infection like impetigo, um, it's, it's just the body's immune response that's causing all that like oozing. Your, their, all of your immune system, your macrolashes, everything is, is like firing up and trying to fight it. And so it's like pus, right? Pus is dead white skin cells that have come to the area to fight. So that, that's the oozing during a flare of <clears throat> like a staph aureus overgrowth. Again, with TSW, the oozing we kind of just talked about, it's just that there's just too much blood and fluid and it's, it's an osmotic pressure issue where it's not, it's not due to an infection. It's just like, it's called interstitial fluid from the body is kind of leaking out. So. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So yeah, let's move on to the treatments. I know this is a really popular topic. And I would love to hear more about how we treat staph aureus. For example, do we always have to turn to antibiotics? Or are there other methods as well? So uh, for me, the answer depends on like, what is the staph aureus doing? Like if you have cellulitis, I think it's completely appropriate to get on oral antibiotics. It's deep in the dermis and you can't put something topical on cellulitis and have it like penetrate and get to the staph in the skin. Um, so in that case, an oral antibiotic is probably the way to go and you'll need a prescription and there can be anything from like Keflex to doxycycline. You know, if it's in Pitigo, um, you can sometimes get away with a topical antibiotic. Um, so that would be um, like a mupirocin ointment. Again, that's prescription only. Don't go to your pharmacy and try to get like a neosporin. A, a full-blown staph infection is not going to respond to a neosporin ointment. You need to see a doctor and get a prescription for like a mupirocin topical ointment. So those are for like infections. I think, you know, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I take stewardship of antibiotics quite seriously. And I'm not anti-antibiotics. I think they are uh, they need to be used appropriately. And so those, are, I think, are appropriate cases for using either oral or topical antibiotics. For my patients with eczema, <clears throat> where I know that there's an overgrowth of staph, and, but we need to get it under control long term, um, I don't use uh, antibiotics, either oral or topical. So for that, um, we do kind of two-pronged approach. One is using things that are going to 
pull that skin pH back down, reacidify the skin, because ultimately dermcidin and defensin, our body's natural defenses, they're going to do a much better job than you know, me or, or any other doctor can do, right? Our bodies are amazing. We want to support it to allow it to work in the way it's meant to. Um, so that's one thing is, is getting that pH naturally back down into an acidic place, let, let the skin do its job. Um, but there are also antimicrobial things that we can use on top of the skin to help beat that staph back down and kind of turn the tide. And then the, the other tricky bit with staph aureus is that it doesn't just live on the skin, it actually colonizes the nose. And so that's another reason why people go through these cyclical flares. Some people even do antibiotics and it's like, I went on antibiotics or I used like a topical mupirocin. The eczema went away, the staph went away, but then it came back. <clears throat> what happened? Where did it come from? Well, it's because uh, we're colonized in our nose. If you have staph aureus problems on your skin, you have staph aureus problems in your nose. It's where it hides out and lives. And so you can take the antibiotics, but it lives on the hairs in the front of the nose. And if you don't kill it there, it can just come back out and reseed as a problem. Um, so all of my patients with eczema, with active eczema, I start them out on a nasal spray as well as the topicals, because I don't want to be going through the flares. We have to get it at its source, uh, you know, where it's colonizing, so it can't come back out and get it wherever the you know flares are happening topically. Thank you. That, that, that's really great. I, I interviewed another doctor who said something similar as well, how they also um, make sure that the area in the nose is, uh, uh, we, we use a spray just to help that place. Yes. Yeah. So in terms of um, other topicals, uh, are there other natural topicals that you would use? For example, um, uh, bath soaks or even adding baking soda to the bath to help calm down the flares? Yeah. So for bleach and baking soda, I don't use either of those. Um, both of them are actually very alkaline. So again, that's, that's the wrong way. I don't want to be making the skin alkaline. I want to be making it acidic. Um, so baking soda like in and of itself isn't toxic, but you know, again, it's, it's the wrong way for me. So I'll, ne I never use baking soda with the bleach baths. The studies show, well, first of all, bleach is very, very alkaline as well. And we used to think, oh, okay, the bleach must be like killing the staph aureus. But then we realized that the bleach is so dilute um, that it's not actually killing off any bacteria. And it has to be dilute because otherwise it's, it's toxic. It will burn your skin. It's why if you're using bleach to clean, you have to use thick rubber, rubber gloves. It's caustic. Alkaline substances will burn your skin actually worse than acids. So the bleach baths are very dilute. And what we think is that it's actually this like vague anti-inflammatory effect. So I don't use either of those substances ever. I'm always going to go to the acidic things. So nice natural things that are acidic, apple cider vinegar. It's super acidic. We have to actually dilute it in water. And again, depending on the level of eczema, Sometimes people can't tolerate it at the beginning. It's super antimicrobial. Staff hates it. So I love using apple cider vinegar. But when someone's skin is in a huge um, eczema flare, they are likely not going to be able to tolerate the apple cider vinegar because it's going to burn. And we can dilute it. You know, I usually start out with a 50-50 dilution of apple cider vinegar and water. I mean, you can make any adjustment. You could just do 10% apple cider vinegar and 90% water. But sometimes water even is too much for people's skin when they're having a big eczema problem. So most of the time with bad eczema, I'm not going to start with the apple cider vinegar, but I am going to bring it in later because the more that the skin heals, the more it can tolerate. And it's like, it's almost like getting a big boulder moving, right? It's like, it's hard at the beginning, but then once, once you get the staff on the run, then you can start bringing in the big guns like the apple cider vinegar and the skin can tolerate it. Um, aloe vera gel is another one that is acidic. Um, sometimes it's too stingy. If the skin is too compromised, there are people who definitely cannot tolerate the aloe at the beginning. So again, I might bring that in later. Something that works very well at the beginning are hydrosols. So I love, love, love hydrosols. They are a natural product of the essential oil making process. So the way to, to, to think about them is, let's say you're making um, like a rosemary essential oil. They're going to take hundreds of pounds of rosemary, you know, twigs and leaves, put it in a copper distiller with water and heat it up. 
The volatile oils are the essential oils. So things heat up and evaporate. They then cool through a, a pipe into a second uh, collection unit. And the essential oils fly, float on the top and then there's water on the bottom. The companies siphon off that top layer of floating oil. That's the essential oil. That's powerful concentrated substances. But underneath it is the water that's evaporated. And it's almost, you can think of like a tea that's like infused with um, the plant. It's acidic, but it's very gentle. So I can use it on babies um, and it's very safe, but it's effective. So at the beginning, hydrosols are a really great option or even tea, just brewing a cup of tea and it can be black tea, green tea, or herbal tea. You're going to get different benefits from each one. Tea wipes are very, um, usually very well tolerated, very soothing to the skin. They're acidic, they're antimicrobial. Um, and so those kind of water-based products, the hydrosols and teas um, are good ways to start initially when the skin is super sensitive before you can work up and, and they're all acidic. For antimicrobial stuff, I do really like colloidal silver. Um, there's a hypochlorous acid product that I use. Um, there's, there are essential oils, but I do not recommend that people do creations on themselves. You have to be very careful. A lot of people with eczema can easily be sensitized or react when a contact dermatitis to essential oils. So, um, I do use them. They are very, very powerful substances and very effective against staff, but I don't recommend that, uh, lay people start experimenting with essential oils and never, never put essentials oils on meat, which is do not put them on directly. They must be diluted in carrier oils in appropriate, um, concentrations. So you, you need to work with somebody who knows what they're doing. Thanks, Dr. Julie. I, I had a question about the, um, the baking soda because it's so popular within the community of uh, eczema and TSW sufferers. So I know a lot of people who use it. So can they use it and then just add um, something acidic after they come out of the, uh, the, sh the shower or bath? So can they do a spray to balance it out, but still get the benefits of the baking soda? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of what I do. So all soap is also alkaline because fundamentally soap is a chemical reaction between lye, which is highly alkaline and fat. So there's no soap that's, that's going to be acidic. Now, I still say, yeah, we still need to use soap. We need gentle soap and in appropriate amounts. But every time we use soap, we are raising the pH. So we do, um, all my patients, like after they soap, we do use, you know, a variety of products to reacidify the skin. So I think that would be a good option for people if they want to use the baking soda in the shower or the bath. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Julie. So one thing we wanted to cover as well was the Dr. Aaron regime. And a lot of people did ask what your thoughts are on this for helping to combat staph. I know he mentions that his regime doesn't lead to topical steroid withdrawal. But yeah, I would love your thoughts on um, how it combat or whether you think it's a good way to combat staph aureus. Yeah, so the Dr. Aaron regime is it's a compounded topical with three basic ingredients. So there's a moisturizer, um, a topical steroid and a topical antibiotic. I don't know the specifics of like which antibiotic I would guess it's me Pearson, but I think he's from the UK. So maybe they use something different over there. Um, I also don't know which steroid he's using and there's a wide range in steroids. Um, uh, we call them classes. So class one is super potent. Um, and it can be like 600 times the lowest level, which is like hydrocortisone is, is kind of the lowest level. Um, and then which moisturizer, but I'll, I'll kind of break it down. I mean, first of all, as a naturopathic doctor, I don't use steroids because for me, that's not a root cause. We know that the person is not deficient in steroids. That's not what is the problem. And so it's a symptom control. And it's a symptom control that for me isn't beneficial. And often leads to more harm than good. So there's, you know, the, at a lower level, a lot of people have the experience where they use the steroids and it does make things better, right? It's suppressing the inflammation. It's pushing things back down into the skin. But as soon as they stop using it, they actually have a bigger flare. And I liken it to like, so if you have a, a tightly, uh, like, you know, a coil and it's really like heavy, but you have to like put all your pressure on it to like hold that coil down. Yeah, you can suppress it, you can hold the coil down, but as soon as you let go, 
not only does the coil come back spring, it springs higher, it's stored energy. And so then it, and it takes time to kind of get even back to where it was. And people experience that a lot of times with topical steroid use. That's kind of on the lower level on, on the worst case scenario, of course, is topical steroid withdrawal, which is horrible, horrible disease that is, is, you know, much more difficult to treat than, than the underlying eczema. So I'm not a fan of topical steroids. I don't prescribe them. His regimen is, you know, and at first he uses it a lot. Um, and then I think you're supposed to kind of taper. The, the one ingredient in there that I can support is the topical antibiotic. And I think he kind of more early on must have realized that there was a staph aureus problem. And that to me is, you know, more of a root cause. So if it's, let's say it's mupirocin and it's in there controlling the staph, you know, I don't really have a problem with that. Um, the way I treat patients is through testing and treating the gut as well as the skin. So it's a, it's a dual pronged approach. You know, we always have to be asking, well, why is the skin, you know, acting this way? What is the dysfunction? And so for me, the root cause is there's always leaky gut and problems in the gut microbiome. And when I fix that, then everything else gets fixed as well. So this isn't root cause enough for me. Um, but I don't, I don't like topical steroids and I don't know the strength of the steroids he's using. I'm okay with the topical antibiotic, and but the moisturizer is another problem for me because most kind of conventional moisturizers are and they're made with oil and water. Why is that a problem? Well, when you think back to like chemistry class, you know, when you were a kid, what happens when you pour oil and water together? They don't mix, right? They float like this. So how in a lotion, how are we getting oil and water together? and stay, keeping them together. Well, you have to use something called an emulsifier, which is a chemical. So the emulsifier smashes the water and the oil molecules together and keeps them together. So now we have water in the product. Uh-oh, once you have water, you have to have preservative. You must, without preservative, this thing with water is gonna become a bacterial fungal overgrowth in a matter of days on a shelf. So now we've got oil, water, emulsifier, and preservative. Let's go back to the oil. What kind of oil is used? Mostly it's things like mineral oil, paraffins, petroleum, petrolatum. Those are all oil extracts from the petroleum industry, from oil. And so there's really nothing about a moisturizer that I like because we have access to water. Uh, I would never use a petroleum-based oil on my patient's skin. Uh, emulsifiers and preservatives are harsh chemicals that really cause all sorts of problems. And with eczematous skin, they're penetrating and you're absorbing them even more than on normal skin. So I, I never use moisturizers like that. I keep my oil and water-based products um, separate. I don't need emulsifier, I don't need preservative, and I never use mineral-based oils on patients. So unfortunately, two out of the three things in there, you know, I don't like, I wouldn't use. Um, but I, can, I guess I can get behind a little bit of topical antibiotic if that helps. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that's why in my uh, Conquer Bond that I created, there's no water in it. So that prevents all those harsh preservatives and ingredients, which I completely understand. Yeah, you know, you don't need it. You, you end up with much better products when you don't do it that way. They're healthier and they're better. They're better for your skin. They're better for you. Um, and it's just, I don't know why we're so, you know, we're so in love with our lotions, but they're actually kind of detrimental to our health and our skin. Thanks for sharing. So someone asked, how do you feel about using tacrolimus ointment for treating staph aureus? I think that goes back similar to what you said about steroids, but I'll let you comment on that. Yeah, so tacrolimus, pimacrolimus, they're, they're calcineurin inhibitors. What word did we just hear? Inhibitor, right? So it's, it's kind of an alternative that dermatologists will use to steroids. There's also eucrisa. Um, or Elidel, uh, which is a PDE4 inhibitor. So all of these are inhibitors, right? They're trying to like crush back down inflammation into the skin. I don't prescribe or use them um, because again, they're not at all addressing the root cause. And I think TSW is actually a misnamed disease. I think we're gonna have to rename it at some point because TSW stands for topical steroid withdrawal. But a lot of people who use tacrolimus or pimacrolinus or uh, eucrisa, they go through TSW as well. And so, or um, oral and 
oral steroids like prednisone. So it's not just topical steroids that cause TSW. So do oral steroids, so do tacrolimus and, and the other kind of in, inhibitor topicals that we're using on skin. Um, so I don't, I don't like it and I don't use it either. I actually really appreciate how you brought up that all those can cause withdrawal as well, because it's not as well known that it can, but a lot mm -hmm. of people and doctors prescribe it as an alternative. Um, there's actually, uh, I, I think I've heard people mention that you can even go through a longer withdrawal when you're on these. And I know there are black box warnings too. I use them a lot as a kid, but, um, if anyone wants, there's also Facebook support groups for, uh, protopic withdrawal and, um, all these other ointments that you can use. But yeah, I had a client who is also on Eucrisha and, um, she was surprised that you can also go on withdrawal with, with that as well. Yeah. So yeah, very, um, very crazy how all these medications can don't actually get to the root, but they can cause all these withdrawal symptoms. Absolutely. So um, someone asked, what is the yellow pus that comes out um, and the yellow crusty stuff that comes out during or, or actually on their skin? They're wondering, uh, yeah, they're wondering for more information on that. Okay, so if you have an infection like impetigo, it, it's the immune cells that are dying. I mean, that's what pus is as well. It's just a collection. I mean, we have lots of different types of immune cells that are called to the area to come do a job and fight and, and try to kill the organism, but they die as well and, and they kind of collect. So it's, it's just part of like mac dead macrophages and, and dead immune cells, basically. Got it. Thanks so much, Dr. Julie. So I think we are on to our, uh, one, our last few questions, but someone's wondering, do you have the name of books we could read uh, to study the topic of staph? You know, I don't know of any specific books on staph. I mean, certainly, you know, for, for dermatologists, there's sections in our dermatology books that cover, you know, cellulitis and erysipelas and, and whatnot. But um, there is that paper. Um, so if your listeners, uh, so you can go to Google Scholar um, if you don't have access to PubMed. And if you search like Staph aureus and eczema, there is that great paper I was referring to that shows that like Staph aureus increases first before the flare of eczema and that the Staph aureus has to decrease before the eczema starts to clear. So I think probably the research studies, and there are several out there relating staph with eczema, might be the best. So go to Google Scholar, type in, you know, staph aureus and eczema, staph aureus and the skin, and those publications I think will probably be the most interesting. Um, because in the derm books, they, they're they really not going to mention staph as it relates to um, eczema. It's not, it's, that connection is not being made by most dermatology books, so... And it's sad that there's not a lot of information out there aside from what you shared about those research papers. I, I wish it was more talked about um, in the community and that people were bringing more awareness to it. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's shocking. I mean, there certainly are plenty of dermatologists who do know about it and treat it, but there's a lot of dermatologists um, where, you know, my patients have been seeing dermatologists and they're just, they've been just prescribes like steroids and then stronger steroids and stronger steroids and the tacrolimus and all the other stuff. And it's clear that if they just went even for a topical bupirocin, life would have gotten dramatically better. And I don't know why the dermatologists, I think they weren't trained in medical school. And then if you're not getting the education, you know, as new information comes out, you just do what you've been doing and you keep doing it. And um, yeah, I agree. It's, it needs to get out a, a lot more within the community. Yep, definitely. So lastly, uh, Amy said that she was prescribed uh, doxycycline, doxycycline and uh, mupirocin for my staph infection, but it hasn't helped yet. I have an appointment at John Hopkins tomorrow. And she also says, do you have any recos for staph aureus and a fungus that has caused an infection of the lips called exfoli exfoliative chelitis? 
So let me say I'm not giving anyone any medical advice. Um, I can only treat people who are my patients and I'm only licensed in California, Oregon and Washington. So I can't give, unfortunately, Amy Sue, I can't give you any, in particular any medical advice. In general, you know, I think if someone, if we think someone has a staph aureus infection and they're not responding to oral doxycycline and topical mupirocin, it's one of two things. It could be MRSA, which is a methylene, a methicillin resistant staph, which then requires other um, antibiotics, um, or it might not be staph aureus. And so if, if you have something, you know, wet and oozing on the skin that can be cultured, um, I do, again, I think that's an appropriate time to ask for a culture and say, like, is this what we think it is? Or maybe it's MRSA and it needs to be, it is a form of staph aureus, but it's resistant and it needs a different thing. For fungus, um, no antibiotic in the world is going to treat fungus because an antibiotic is only something that kills bacteria. And actually what we find is that when people take antibiotics, fungal uh, problems can over, can explode. So candida is a fungal organism, for example, it's a it's yeast, which is a single celled fungal organism. And I think a lot of women know that when they take antibiotics, they are at risk for a vaginal yeast infection. And it is due to this because we have bacteria in the vagina called lactobacillus that normally live in our vaginal canal and they create um, lactic acid. Well, what word did we just hear? Acid. We need an acidic environment in our vagina too, to be healthy. And when you take an antibiotic and it kills off the good bacteria like lactobacillus, there may be a little bit of candida in there. It's not a big deal. But when the, the good guy lactobacillus dies, who's been keeping that acidic pH, suddenly candida can grow unfettered and it also wants a higher pH. So it's a little bit tricky when you have staph aureus and a fungal infection, right? You're gonna, if you use pharmaceutical antibiotics, you can make, you can drive the fungal infection further. That's another reason why I like herbs because herbs are broad spectrum. So when you think about plants living out in nature, you know, how do they fight? Well, they don't punch, they can't get up and run away. They are the original chemical plants, right? They produce chemicals. They have to be able to fight bacteria and fungus and viruses. So every plant is broad spectrum. Now we definitely use certain plants to target bacterial problems, certain plants for viral, certain plants for fungal, but we don't have the same problem with herbs that we do with pharmaceuticals where, oh, if I give you this herb, I could cause you a candida a yeast infection. No. So I, I personally treat, you know, staph and fungal stuff with herbs internally and topically. I don't use pharmaceuticals, um, but I can't give Amy any, you know, specific medical advice. Thanks so much, Dr. Julie. We all really appreciate everything you share today in terms of how we treat staph aureus. I really appreciate your knowledge on this topic, especially since you mentioned that not a lot of practitioners out there are aware or focused on this issue. So your knowledge is so much appreciated. And I really uh, thank you for everything you shared on this show. Do you have any last words of, of advice that you want to share with anyone today before we end today's episode? Um, you know, just that patients should advocate for themselves. Um, you know, if you if the only options you're getting from your doctor are topical steroids, you know, try to find uh, uh, you know nutritionists like yourself who practices um, you know in a functional way and, and uses stool and, and gut testing to get more to the heart of the matter. You can find naturopathic doctors like myself. Um, I'm licensed in California, Oregon, and Washington, so I can only see patients in those states. Um, but um, if, if you contact me, I'm at integrativedermatologycenter.com. Yeah, I can try to get you to um, maybe somebody who can help. But, you know, advocate for yourselves. There are a lot, a lot of options out there other than just steroids and, and things like that. And, you know, even with the, with the um, topical, with the like staph problems, if you think you have a staph infection and you ask for a culture and you have a oozing, you know, sore and they won't culture it, go get a second opinion. Like they should be culturing something if it's oozing and infected, um, particularly in, in the case of Amy Sue, where a conventional, you know, oral and topical plan, it's not responding to that. Then, then you need to keep asking questions. But there are a lot of alternatives out there to steroids and you really can get to the root cause of eczema and clean it up. Just, just don't forget about the staph aureus as one of the culprits. 
Thank you so much. It looks like we have a lot of people who are saying thank you for the great information that you provided, Dr. Julie. So I, I know you just named your clinic. Did you want to leave any um, contact info for people to reach you at? Yeah, uh, just the best is to go to my website, integrativedermatologycenter.com. Um, and there's, you know, info on there and, and my contact information is all on there. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Julie. And thank you everyone for just being here and for listening. I hope this episode helped you. Let us know what future topics you want us to talk about. And we look forward to releasing new episodes where you get to learn more about how to help uh, you overcome your skin rashes. Take care and have a great day.